We're back in 1991 and I'm thinking of the things we've done other times we have featured this year. Should I be happy? Should I fear? Will it be terrible? Or will it be fun? Newsflash people, we're back for the fourth time in the year 1991 and it isn't the worst week we've ever covered. Kicking off this week with the section that was in 1991 terms considered both gnarly and bodacious. Hello and goodbye. <laughs> Into the top 10 this week are You Could Be Mine, re-entering after a week off for its 13th and final week in the top 10, and dear old Jenny Morris, whose break in the weather is up from 14 last week to 8 for the first of its 6 weeks in the 10, highlighted by a week at number 2. Retreating this week are Pump It Hard by Icy Blue after 3 weeks topping out at 8, and it's a case of GNR for GNR as Don't Cry slips from 10 to 13 after 4 weeks or a hit number 5, Don't Cry having debuted at number 8. The biggest hit entering the chart this week is I'm Too Sexy by Right Said Fred, which was to spend 2 weeks at number 1. The biggest hit to have left the chart this week was Read My Lip by Melissa, which also spent 2 weeks on top back in July. The next number one record hitting the top at the end of the month is Airbag Undoes Humidity by Jock Mines. This week, the song title incorporates both the title of the song and the act's name, and the performer is the vocalist featured. This record will spend two weeks at number one and be disposed of by that rarest of creatures, a record that debuts at number one. Tenny Ten is You Could Be Mine by Guns N' Roses, returning for a week in the big show after dropping to 11 last week. It's 13th and final week in the 10. Fans of all things Screechy and Les Pauly rejoiced. Number 9 is Heavy D and the Boys with their doofy dooferous cover of the OJ's Wonderful Now That We Found Love. It's not actually that bad in a very silly sort of way. Rapper is strictly old school on the beat, Biggie Smalls not yet being a thing of course, and the very least it makes you think, hmm, the OJs were really great, weren't they? Five weeks in the top ten for a top of six. This was Heavy D's only hit here, but he did record a few albums and a fair career as an actor. He was the man who gave Sean Diddy Coombs his first job in the biz. Sadly, he died in 2011 from a blood clot in his leg caused by DVT. In at eight, we have the popular local Jenny Morris. Well, she's a New Zealander, but we loved her anyway. Top backup and session singer Morris broke out in the late 80s with a string of great singles that, when she wasn't writing them herself, were provided by A-list friends, members of In Excess and Split Ends amongst them, and got some great producers, Andrew Farris, Mark Moffat, Nick Launay, et al. Break in the Weather, which she wrote herself, was her biggest hit, peaking at number two. Six weeks in the 10 and 17 all up. Vocal problems stopped her career, but she stayed active in the business, being head of the APRA AMCOS since 1983. That's an organisation that makes sure that composers get paid copyright money in Australia. So everybody loves Jenny. Seven is where it's at right now, and what where it at is, is the Scorpions with Wind of Change, which sounds like Dire Straits playing Poodle Rock. It sounds like the singer's first language is in English. Swedish perhaps, maybe German? The whistling is annoying. Whiddly diddly guitar solo. Goes on forever. Seven is as high as it got. Songs like this make me miss ABBA. At number six is last week's 11 week number one, Everything I Do, I Do It For You by Brian Adams. The chart journey of which has been two, one, until we're all sick of it, six, 30 and done. The record company withdrew it from sale, presumably to make people buy the album, which is at number two this week. Whatever mastermind decided this didn't have a follow-up ready, the mutt lang by numbers, but catchy as hell, or therefore catchy as hell, can't stop this thing we'd started, can't get started, despite debuting at 18 three weeks ago, making heavy weather of it only getting to 12 and eventually punking out at nine. E-I-D-I-D-I-F-Y was the biggest hit of the year, despite being as annoying as hell. Five, I think I've mellowed a bit, you know. Usually when I'm doing a 1991 video, I'm in a fit of apocalyptic rage by this point, but no, I'm doing fine now. At five is Tony Childs, a big-lunged American come Aussie who made quite the splash with her Janis Joplin But She Can Actually Sing influenced first album with its fashionable world music neo-hippie vibes. And I've Got To Go Now is a splendid slice of modern melodrama that spent a month in the 10 with five being its best. First time I ever took my daughter to a music festival as an 11 year old, we were watching Tony Charles sing and TC thought it would be a good idea if she came down on the grass. So she came off the stage and sat down with us and had a bit of a singy song. Down she came 
and she plonked herself right down next to Ivy. Freaked the poor kid right out. Ben Lee never took such liberties. Henry Wagon did pretty much jump over her on the chase to a five-year-old who'd annoyed him in the crowd later on in the day, but still, Tony Trials freaked my daughter out. Caloundra was a great festival, but they killed her. We shall forego the pleasures of the trade-up this week because, frankly, the talent pool is pretty thin at the lower ends of the charts and there's just nothing that deserved much better than what it got. So we will forge ahead with... Number four, and it's UB40 with their flaccid cover of the great Al Green's 1973 top tenor, Here I Am. UB40 started life as a ferocious dub-influenced reggae act, but by this stage of the career they were little more than rank and skank by numbers. Al Green is a path best followed noisily because you are never going to beat him at his own game. Spent a respectable nine weeks in the top ten for a high of three weeks at three. The spark having gone from the band, they still managed a few more hits, including a number one, with milk toast versions of well-known songs. Number three is the girl who would be Kylie, Melissa with sexy as the word. The follow-up to her number one hit, Read My Lips. She would have been Kylie, but she wasn't. She was a soap opera star, a fine-looking young lady, and she wasn't the worst singer in the world. Her rapping, though, was terrible. And she favoured a heavier disco sound than Kylie's stock Aiken Waterman pop beats. Sexy as the word is pretty much an exact clone of her previous hit, Read My Lips, with some very 1991 orchestra samples, courtesy no doubt of an Amiga 1200. But her vocal here is thinner, more Kylie-like, and lacks the brassy confidence of RML. Did pretty well nevertheless, spending a couple of weeks at number three, but it was over and done on the charts in three months. She sang at the 1991 Rugby League Grand Final, had three more top 40 hits, and has popped up on TV every now and then. Now, condemned forever to some perpetual sub-Kylie existence, she's a B-tier gay icon and a suburban mum. Number two is Big Audio Dynamite the second with Rush. I mean, hooray! Big Audio Dynamite's 1985 album was one of my essential 80s records. I played it translucent back in the day, and I still love it to death. But after a damp squib that was the follow-up, number 10, Upping Street, the lead-off single was great. The rest, despite Mick Jones and Joe Strummer working together again, was so-so. Things looked pretty grim for B.A.D. Rush, accordingly, came as a complete surprise. It's fine, not exceptional, for the first minute and a half, and then, well... Let's just say it gets totally 1991. I'm sure it went down a treat in the discos. Anyway, two weeks on top and a whopping 26 weeks on the charts all up shows you what I know. Here on the moon, you have to look up to see the earth. If you look down, of course, you see the moon. Bananas are berries, but strawberries aren't. Kellogg's tell us that Tony the Tiger, beloved cereal mascot, is of Italian-American heritage. Facts are the result of rational inquiry, but they aren't the reason for it. Here are some facts that are the result of irrational inquiry. It's Val's fantastic world of fact. Biggest riser this week is break in the weather, up six places to number nine. The descender this week is former top ten of things that make you go, mmm, down seven to thirty-one. Biggest debutante is Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch with Good Vibrations. I don't know this song and I have no desire to know it, so I can't tell you if it's the good, 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 good vibrations or not. And our longest enduring hit this week is the second biggest hit of the year, the Grease Mega Mix, down in the very lower realms of the top 40. A five week number one, it's in its 23rd week on the chart. Number one in the rockin' USA was Mariah Carey with Emotions, who had deposed Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch a fortnight ago. And in the uck, it was still everything I do. It was on a record-busting 16 weeks at the top. This time last year, the jolly old number one was Blaze of Glory by John Bon Jovi, featuring the great Jeff Beck on guitar. And next year, in the Here There Be Dragons territory for this series, it'll be the infamous Achy Breaky Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus. There's so much wrong with that song. I think the worst thing is the drumming. The worst thing you can say about the drumming is like, I could do it. That's how bad it is. And the number one album on town this week and its third week on top is Use Your Illusion Volume 2 by Guns N' Roses. Use Your Illusion Volume 1 is at number four. UYI 2 debuted at number one and UYI 1 at two three weeks ago. Brian Adams is waking up the neighbors will knock it off next week and it'll end up the 18th biggest selling album for the year.
Use Your Illusion 2 was the 50th biggest selling album worldwide in the 1990s and the 128th biggest selling album of all time. Here are the top 12 selling albums of the 1990s. 12. Oz Madonna's Immaculate Collection from 1990, 30 million copies to the good, which is as many as the second biggest selling album of the 1960s. Madonna is slightly bested by Nirvana's Nevermind from 1991, with just over the 30 million mark, but I have to say I listen to Madonna way more than Sad Old Kurt. There's a real traffic jam down this end of the chart, and at 10 we have Mariah Carey's Music Box from 1993. Does anyone listen to Mariah Carey anymore? Number 9 is the soundtrack to the movie Titanic. It's mainly film music with that one interminable Celine Dion song, so that's remarkable. It sold over a million copies in six different countries. The US, Germany, France, Canada, Japan and Taiwan. Well, calling Taiwan a country just got my video banned in China, didn't it? 8 is old Celine Dion again with her Let's Talk About Love album from 1997. Curiously, while selling more than the Titanic soundtrack, this sold less than half the copies in Taiwan, which is totally a country. 7. We're into the 20 biggest sellers of all time here with the 32 million seller ABBA Gold, the almost but not quite perfect greatest hits disc. Fourth biggest seller ever in Australia, it's the seventh biggest seller ever in New Zealand, but 1975's Best of ABBA is still the second biggest seller there, and it doesn't have Dancing Queen on it. 6. Celine was the queen who sold umpteen copies of her 1996 album Falling Into You, this year's biggest seller. Celine Dion owned the 90s. Not judging or anything, but this has outsold Sgt. Pepper's. It really puts the impact of classic rock into perspective, doesn't it? 5. is Metallica's Black Album from 1991 with around 34 million. This week, Enter Sandman is at number 17 on the charts, from a peak of number 8. 4. Alanis Morissette just edges out Metallica for number 4 with Jagged Little Pill, 1995's biggest seller. And 3. We're into the 10 biggest sellers ever, with the Canadian Ladian who makes Celine Dion look like a piker and the country cutie Taylor Swift wishes she could sell like. Shania Twain, whose 1997 Come On Over topped 40 million copies. 2. The Backstreet Boys Millennium takes second spot with about 40 and a half million sales. In Australia, they only sold one half of 1% of those numbers. That's something I feel a great sense of national pride in. And the top seller for the decade, the fourth biggest selling album of all time, 45 million copies, is the soundtrack to The Bodyguard, anchored by Whitney Houston. The best thing about this album is that it made two songwriters and two of the nicest people in the business, Nick Lowe and Dolly Parton, very, very rich. Although, thanks to Jolene and 9 to 5, Dolly was probably already mint. That's my story, I'm sticking to it anyway. And without further ado, we move on to this week's number one, the arrival of which can only mean it's Monty time. This week's number one is Love Thy Will Be Done. Up from two last week, where it had been parked for a month behind that intransient Canadian, it sounds pretty much like a Prince song with him singing in his lower register. It only spent a week on top, back to number two next week, becoming one of 25 songs we've seen so far to spend as many as five weeks at number two. Four of them never made number one, but for it dropped off the charts very quickly after that. Pretty good and all, but it still only managed to be the 14th biggest hit of the year. And that, my good, good people, is how the cow ate the cabbage this week, October 13th, 1991. A fun week this week, and should the good Lord be a willin' and the creeks don't rise, I'll see you again with another episode next week. Ish. Ish.